Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is William Lucas. I'm in my third year of my PhD in medical anthropology. I'm also in the final year of my concurrent degree program in public health with a focus on epidemiology. In my time at USF, I've had the great opportunity to work directly with Dr. Heidi Castaneda. Under her guidance, I've analyzed interview data from an NSF-funded research project on health and life experiences of mixed legal status migrant families who live in communities living along the Texas-Mexico border. I've learned how to translate some of the most pressing issues into tangible research projects. In terms of migrant health, this means navigating the medical legal setting in order to understand how individual health is entangled with social, cultural, structural, and political dilemmas. In my current research focus, I aim to understand how people with spinal cord injuries encounter policies and health interventions that may place limits on their lives. By focusing on how rehabilitation interacts with and fits into people's lives, I aim to expand social scientific understanding of how organizations and people's social networks interact with the thoughts, emotions, and behaviors on which we often focus. By using qualitative and statistical methods I refined by working with Dr. Castaneda, I seek to understand how people with spinal cord injuries encounter life-altering circumstances and often continue to strive for a return to the social and physical functioning, which we often theorize that they've lost, especially in the current COVID-19 pandemic. It is critical that there is an understanding of how individuals with these injuries navigate various life aspects of their lives, often depending on caretakers, doctors, and physical therapists, as it reveals a meaningful fragility inherent in what it means to be human. Similarly, in Dr. Castaneda's research, it means that some of the most tragic vulnerabilities occur among those populations most hidden from our view. Introducing Dr. Castaneda tonight is Dean Eric Eisenberg from the College of Arts and Sciences. And it is my great pleasure to welcome him tonight to our conversation. It has been so wonderful to share some of my experiences with you. And I hope that you'll all enjoy Dr. Castaneda's talk this evening. <laughs> Dean Eisenberg, take it away. Thank you so much, William, for your wonderful introduction. And uh, we wish you the best in finishing your degree program and going on to do incredible things in those wonderful areas. Uh, our students are, are just spectacular, and it's always great to hear from them. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see you for our third of virtual trailblazers of the academic year. Thank you so much for spending your evening with the College of Arts and Sciences. We have a great talk by Professor Castaneda for you tonight, one that will provide you with new insights about how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted marginalized communities, including migrants and immigrants, as well as discussing future policy implications. Before I introduce Dr. Castaneda, I want to thank our alumni and friends whose generous contributions enable the College of Arts and Sciences to host these Trailblazers lectures for more than 42 years. It is our hope that by connecting our outstanding faculty to the community, we can advance important discussions related to their research, work that, like our presentation today, has a timely connection to emerging real-world events. I also want to let you know that the wonderful music you heard during the opening of this event was provided by the USF Jazz Tet Group, the top small group in our internationally acclaimed USF Jazz Studies program. <laughs> and I, uh, an additional plug is once we get back to face-to-face, -face, if you haven't been to our music theater and heard our jazz, our jazz performance, you really need to do that. I'd also like to take a moment to highlight some of the university's current work related to strategic renewal. As you know, we hired a new president a year ago, and one of the President Corral's top priorities is to, to develop a future 10-year strategic direction for USF that is both responsive to changing conditions in higher education worldwide and also builds upon our unique assets, competencies, and opportunities. And it's been really, really gratifying to spend the last couple of months reflecting on what USF does uniquely well. We really are a different kind of university, and articulating that as a way of positioning ourselves for the future is a really uh, wonderful process to go through. We've been speaking with students and staff and faculty and community uh, members to help guide the strategic plan, which we hope to have put together by this coming summer. Uh, one thing we know for sure is that part of this plan is to maintain preeminence 
uh, in the state of Florida. We are the only metropolitan preeminent university, and we uh, plan to stay that way, uh, but also to con continue our pursuit of becoming a top 25 public research university and also to become eligible for membership in the prestigious Association of American Universities, which is the AAU. So it's with your support and your feedback on issues such as this that has helped advance the university's profile and reputation around the country and around the world. Uh, it wasn't that long ago where if you talk to somebody in South America or California or Europe and you mentioned the University of South Florida, people said, where is that? What is that? But now we have name recognition, people saying, what are you guys doing down there? We really want to know more about this. So we appreciate you engaging with us, and we hope that your continued involvement in these important discussions will help propel USF and the college to the next level in our pursuit of excellence in higher education. I've said to you many, many times before that there really is no great city in the world that does not also have a great university and vice versa. And that's our aim to sort of follow the trajectory of the Tampa Bay region. As Tampa Bay region becomes a great world city, great region, uh, we want to be a great research university in the midst of that. Those of you who are uh, Trailblazers followers, you know that our past uh, talks have looked at very diverse topics, as, uh, such as the role religion plays in politics, philosophy and entrepreneurship, climate change, and other timely topics, just as tonight does as well. And as we continue to navigate the unique challenges of this pandemic, many obstacles have presented themselves outside of what the news has been covering. For months, we've, we've all heard about uh, crowded hospitals, finding PPE, uh, economic impact, and, and more. Uh, I tell my colleagues in the College of Business that people who didn't understand supply chain and have, have now been unable to get toilet paper and paper towels, they now understand supply chain. So these things have come forward. But what the news hasn't covered is some other areas, such as what you're going to hear about tonight. So our speaker tonight has spent the last 20 years leading and conducting research related to migration, issues in migrant health, health policy, mixed status families, and citizenship. And our talk tonight will examine what the future of migration will look like in a post-pandemic world and explore shifts in patterns in border crossings, immigration laws, and their effects on individuals and families. As part of the program, we're going to host the Q&A portion using the chat box. So the chat box will open about halfway through Dr. Castaneda's talk, and she will address your questions and comments when she's uh, done with her presentation. So finally, to the introduction, Dr. Heidi Castaneda is a professor of anthropology at the University of South Florida. She's the author of Borders of Belonging, Struggle and Solidarity in Mixed Status Immigrant Families and co-editor of Unequal Coverage, The Experience of Healthcare Reform in the United States. Her latest book, Migrant Health, Cross-Disciplinary and Critical Perspectives, is forthcoming. Dr. Castaneda has also published dozens of research articles on migration and healthcare access for immigrant populations. And her work, as William pointed to, has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, the Fulbright Program, the German Academic Exchange Service, and the Wenner Grand Foundation for Anthropological Research. Please give a warm virtual USF welcome to Dr. Heidi Castaneda. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dean Eisenberg, and thank you all for joining us here tonight. Um, I want to begin by saying that um, when I first proposed the title of this talk, Migration and Borders in a Post-Pandemic World, um, this was back in June of last year, 2020, when I um, proposed the title. And I have to say, I, have, I, I had a little more confidence at that time that there even was going to be such a thing as a post-pandemic world. <laughs> Um, so I'm not really sure what that means at this point, and a lot has happened in the meantime, not just with the pandemic, but with the election. Um, and so our landscape has shifted quite a bit since last June. And so what I'm going to propose that I do today is that I'm going to first briefly set up a little bit about the study of migration and borders. I'm going to talk then about my recent book, Borders of Belonging which is about mixed status families in the U.S. Um, and hopefully you'll see that there's some policy implications and impacts for local communities, including here in the Tampa Bay area. Um, and then I'm going to return at, at the second towards the end of the talk to talk about the pandemic and offer a few thoughts about what it continues to highlight in regards to borders and migration. So let me go ahead and get started. And um, if you could put up the PowerPoint, please. All right. 
So um, I said I was going to begin by just sort of setting up this concept, the, these, the study of migration and borders. And really what I want to point out here is that as a migration researcher, I view migration as part of what it means to be human. So in other words, migration is uh, really a fundamental part of our behavior as a species. Um, we have migrated since uh, we, we've been on this earth. Uh, but at the same time, I want to not take for granted that it is a natural occurrence. In other words, it is often in response to dire circumstances either um, violence or um, economic, I'm sorry, ecological destruction. So there are a lot of reasons why we should not consider it a natural phenomenon, but it is part of what it means to be human. For this reason, it's really important to think about migration as um, on a continuum between force and choice. In other words, we hear a lot about things like labor migrants or refugees that are fleeing persecution or violence. And it's not always really straightforward to distinguish between the two of those. So some people may be fleeing violence that is economic in its origins and in its expression. So um, what I would encourage you to think of as uh, when you think about migration is that forced migration and voluntary migration are just many of the points that are on the spectrum. One of the reasons I want to emphasize this before I get started is that when we look at migration and think of it as unusual, extraordinary, or even as pathological, uh, what ends up happening is we carry over a lot of assumptions into our politics, into our practice, and into our scholarship. So recognizing it as a fundamental human impulse, I think, is the, the starting point for understanding migration as a phenomenon. Next slide, please. All right. So um, I just wanted to briefly put up a, a, a map that shows some of the major migration routes in the world today. I'm not going to belabor this much. Um, it probably looks quite familiar to you. I will say that it obscures a lot. It obscures a lot of migration happening um, in, in, in south to south migration or also migration that is happening um, in within countries that is really very significant. I, I wanted to put this up here because I've along the course of my scholarship have found myself um, at many of these migration points. I mean, the, the work I'm going to talk about today um, is in uh, South Texas. So it's really the migration route you see there um, going through Central America to North America. But I've also done quite a bit of work in Europe on migration. And uh, my current project is going to be looking at, my upcoming project is looking at uh, migration in, in Morocco in North Africa. So um, coincidentally, I, I feel like I've found myself on many of these migration routes. But I wanted to point out that this is a, a, a map that really uh, privileges certain kinds of migration to the north, which is not necessarily the primary um, movements we're seeing today. Next slide, please. OK, I'm going to talk a bit about my book, uh, Borders of Belonging. Uh, you can see the cover there. And I want to um, really highlight a few of the, the, the contributions of this book and then uh, turn to the issue of um, what, what this means for COVID-19 and a post-pandemic world. So I want to begin with this quote. This is a, a quote that really sort of encapsulates what the book is about and what really uh, brought me to this research, what really intrigued me about this topic. So this is a quote by Lisa. She's a 22-year-old college student in Texas. She's a U.S. citizen, and she lives, uh, she lives in a family where her parents are undocumented and her older brother is undocumented. So here she says, everybody is undocumented in my family. So that's really all I grew up knowing. Even though I'm a US citizen, it's kind of like I got used to those norms. So it's always like I myself was undocumented. So this was a phenomenon that I was seeing over and over again. And I wanted to really pursue it and understand what it means to grow up in a family uh, where people may be undocumented and how that affects one's own sort of being in the world and the opportunities and resources that come along with that. So um, what is a mixed status family? Es essentially, when I talk about mixed status family, the way that I'm defining it is that it is a, a family in which at least one person is undocumented. Um, and many people, other people in the family may have other statuses. So. Um, Typically, in the research that I do, the parents are undocumented, the older siblings may have DACA status, or they may be undocumented, and then the younger siblings tend to be U.S. citizens born in the United States. Um, I do consider the mixed status family to be a, a really primary feature of immigration in the United States today. And um, you know, there's a couple of different reasons for that. Uh, I do want to point out that uh, this is a phenomenon that maybe is a bit surprising to folks, um, affects about 16.7 million people in the United States. So this is a really large uh, set of people affected by the quote unquote illegality of at least one family member. 
Um, and that includes a, a lot of citizen children. As you can see here, I have 4.5 million U.S. citizen children who are impacted by the uh, by by living in a mixed status family. And those are the, the folks I'm going to talk about today here. Um, so really, the argument I'm going to make, and we'll return to this later, is that the construction of illegality, quote unquote, um, is uh, for some for some members of a family influences opportunities and resources for everyone in the family. So let me talk just really briefly about my study site. Um, I, I've mentioned already that it was in South Texas. This is a region in the county that I worked in. One in 10 people are undocumented. So it's a it's a county, it's a part of the United States where there's a very high proportion of folks who are undocumented. And it's a pretty, pretty common phenomenon. Everybody knows somebody who's either undocumented or living in a mixed status family. In fact, they usually are themselves. Um, and so I went to this county uh, in South Texas because I was really interested in this phenomenon. And I conducted ethnographic research there, which is essentially, it's a fancy term in anthropology, which really means long-term uh, engagement with the local community. I um, Not only did I do interviews with folks, but I um, did what we call participant observation, which means that I, I spent a lot of time in their households, and then I also uh, participated in community activities, everything from protests to, um, you know, uh, community uh, education events. Um, basically, over the course of five years, I tried to be really involved with that community, and that involvement continues to this day. Unfortunately, with, with uh, the pandemic, I haven't been able to return in the last year, but I do stay very much up to date with everyone uh, in, in, through, via social media and other, in other ways. Um, as for the data, the data is primarily based on interviews with uh, 100 families. So the unit of analysis was not the individual, but rather the family. Um, for the study, we interviewed two to five people per family. Um, and this was a longitudinal study in which we went back and interviewed people again. So we we, all, we went back after uh, a year or two and interviewed uh, the same people over and over again to kind of see what had changed in their lives and also to sort of triangulate, you know, how different people talked about the same thing within the family. Um, if there was, and I'll show you some examples here in a moment. Um, one one small detail, which is actually a very important point and not on this slide here, is that I was fortunate to work together with uh, somebody who was herself from a mixed status family. She herself had DACA status. She was formerly undocumented. Um, and um, she was a fantastic research assistant, um, Dr. Milena Mello, who is now um, an assistant professor at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Her assistance in this project was really invaluable. And so I was really proud to see her um, develop her own career along the way. She had a very similar um, a dissertation topic, so we worked quite close together. So let me tell you a little about the region. This is a, a really quick map of what uh, what we're talking about, basically in the very tip of Texas. Um, I'd rather talk about this second map that I've put up here because it's going to become a little bit more relevant in what I talk about than the actual map of Texas. So. Um, here in this map, you can see that I've labeled it the second river. As it turns out, there is um, a 100-mile zone in the United States where the uh, where the um, where Customs and Border Protection has extraordinary um, abilities to search and seize property uh, without a warrant. And so this this area that you see in white here on this map represents this 100-mile zone um, from the international border to the interior of the United States. And in this zone, people can be stopped. They can be asked about their citizenship status. They can be asked for their papers, their property, their vehicles can be searched without a warrant. Um, some scholars have referred to this as the uh, as a decon deconstitutionalized zone. Um, I'm not quite sure I would go quite that far because there are, there are some legal precedents of why this has been, you know, mostly dealing with narcotics trafficking as to how this zone emerged. But I will point out, and we could talk about this later if someone's interested, that 100 miles from an international boundary would include the entire state of Florida, for example. So one important aspect of what I'm going to tell you is that this 100-mile extraordinary space really only exists in the southwest uh, border. And I think uh, there's there's a couple of compelling reasons why that is and why we don't see this phenomenon occurring in places like Florida or in some larger cities on the northeast coast, for example. Um, so if I can kind of talk a little bit about um, what what that means. Um, essentially, what you're when you live in South Texas, you're facing a um, a, a 
a space where there's a lot of different, uh, there are several different layers of, of jurisdiction and people can uh, essentially uh, ask you for your papers and, and, and stop you beyond the international border itself. And so what we talk about as, uh, as a migration scholars is that this is essentially re-spatialized borders. It has pushed the border, the international border, into the interior of the United States. And it's done that not only through these checkpoints, and you can see an example here in the photograph, not only are there checkpoints set up on highways all along along uh, this 100-mile zone, but also through technology, right? There are a number of surveillance technologies that we now use that have re-spatialized borders into the interior. And in, in the space that I'm talking about in particular, um, there's a, a sense of confinement, a geography of containment is how I talk about it, where people essentially get trapped in this space because they can't go to the interior of the United States. Um, and I would argue that this really transforms what it means to be even a citizen in, this, in the United States, because a lot of U.S. citizens have argued that this, um, that they feel um, that this violates their, their, their rights as citizens to be subject to searching uh, at any time. What I'm most interested in, the, in is the fact that this is used as a form of immigration enforcement, and with that comes uh, racial profiling. So this is a scenario where you're seeing uh, cars stopped on highways, and uh, Customs and Border Patrol have to then assess whether or not they judge someone to potentially be in the country without authorization. And they do that through a number of means. They, it might have to do with how you look, how good your English is, um, what you're wearing, what kind of car you're in, who else is in the car with you. And one thing that's quite interesting is that people that I talked to in my study um, had a lot of uh, had a lot to say about this, and it didn't always overlap with. Um with their legal status. So if somebody was fair-skinned, fair had blue eyes or lighter colored eyes, um, they might not be a, they might be an undocumented immigrant, but they were never stopped. On the other hand, someone with a heavy accent um, was frequently stopped, even when they were U.S. citizens. And so this is really a, a good example of how these, these practices not only encourage racial profiling, but absolutely rely on racial profiling as part of the enforcement practice. Um, some of the people I talked to talked about um, uh, phenotype passports or camouflage, ways in which they could pass easily as more uh, more white or more American. And I will say that those two concepts were very much conflated in the study, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, so one, one of the first takeaways I want you to ha have from my talk today is that immobility through the form of these kinds of spaces of containment is as much a feature of migration as is mobility, right? So immobility has been, become really important um, in our world today. Um, and just to return to the issue of sort of racialized spaces, this is another view of this map where you can see that um, the density of communities of color uh, falling within this 100-mile zone, and, and of course, in South Texas, it's quite marked. So let me return to the original question, which is how does illegality for some members of a family influence opportunities and resources for everyone in that family? I'm going to go through a couple of different um, points of, of, and ways in which this happens. I'm going to go through seven different points, and then I'll open it up and talk a little bit more about the, uh, the issue of the pandemic and how that fa factors in here. So the first thing you've already seen, which is that depending on your legal status, you're going to have different forms of physical mobility. It becomes stratified within the family. Family. Um, people talk about being being able to travel north to cities in Texas like like Houston or Austin um, with, with when other family members are not able to. And you can see a few quotes here. People talk about being trapped like a rat in a cage in the zone between the international border and the checkpoints going north. Some people say we're stuck on an island. And I really like this quote that says, it's easier to enter the United States from Mexico than to travel within the United States. Again, speaking to the re-spatialization of borders that we're really seeing today. A second, uh, a second uh, factor that comes along with this is that with physical mobility being constrained, social mobility is very much hampered. Um, and um, the way this plays out in mixed status families is that people, depending on their legal status, may encounter a different other kinds of borders, additional borders, um, as they try to get jobs or attend college in places outside of their region that they live in. And I'll give you a couple examples here in a minute. So essentially stratifying within a family the opportunities they ex that exist. So here's Melanie. She's a U.S. citizen, and I'll just read this quote for you. She says, um, I got into so many universities up north, but my parents weren't going to be able to be at my graduation ceremony anywhere past the checkpoints. 
So I didn't want to go if after all their hard work paid off, they can't even attend my graduation. I went into a depression my freshman year because I felt like I wasted my own potential. It was just my fear of leaving my family. So Melanie, in this case, um, had opportunities to go other places in the United States and opted because of her family status to not to not leave the family alone. So a third implication is that, as you might imagine, where this is leading is that household dynamics are, are certainly affected as well. Um, as legal status stratifies um, opportunities and resources within a family. Now, this is kind of hard to get at. This is something where doing field work uh, for five years is really helpful and returning to families and talking to them again and getting more of the story is really critical. Because as you might imagine, people don't like to talk about conflict within their families. And so um, really, getting to know folks and, and ask them about stories is, is, was critical here. Um, however, it did talking with people, it did really uncover that there were instances where, where there was jealousy, anger, and resentment very, um, very visible in the family because of different legal statuses. Let me give you an example. Uh, Melanie here says, my brother, he's undocumented, my brother holds this really big resentment towards my parents because they brought him here at the wrong time. I always hear them argue. He gets mad, saying, why did you bring us here? You screwed me over. Right. So here you see a tension between Melanie, who's a U.S. citizen, and her undocumented older brother, who feels like he was left out of the, the bargain when his parents brought him. Here's another similar example. Justin is a 26-year-old DACA recipient. Um, Justin has a twin sister. Uh, they're the same age. They have the same exact biography, the same history, the same um, arrival time to the United States, and yet they have very different opportunities because he was awarded DACA status and she was not, despite having virtually identical applications. So here Justin says, because my sister is still undocumented, sometimes I hide things from her because... Uh, oh, here I am showing off. Like traveling, I actually try not to travel because I don't want her to feel bad that she can't do that. We had the same history, the same life that we both lived through, and I have this privilege that she doesn't, you know? Right, so here you see a, a, a set of siblings who are actually twins being torn apart by their differential opportunities. So a fourth implication is that um, not only does it affect uh, relationships within the family, but also relationships with people outside the family, everything from schools, teachers, people in their communities, neighbors, friends, romantic relationships. Um, and that was something I was really quite interested in, in exploring was how intimate relationships like friendships and romantic relationships were impacted by people's status or because they lived in a mixed status family. They themselves weren't undocumented, but maybe their parents were. Can you imagine that that might actually even impact to the, those relationships. So a lot of them talked about telling little lies to people who were their close friends or intimate partners because they were afraid of them finding out about their status or judging them or their family members. So let me just give you a, a couple of examples of that here. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with the slide. So uh, Jessica, uh, she's 18 years old. She was a high school student. Uh, she's a U.S. citizen. Um, and here in this quote, she tells me, um, and I remember this quote really well because we were sitting in her bedroom and she was crying. She was crying and telling me the story of how she couldn't confide in the person that had been her best friend since second grade. She says, my best friend doesn't even know. Sometimes she asks, why don't you travel with your parents? And I'm like, oh, we don't have money. I'd rather just keep it to myself. What happens if one day we have a falling out? I don't want to hurt. I don't want to risk any of that. I should be able to tell her anything. I mean, she's my best friend, you know, and I can't tell her that. So in this case, what Jessica couldn't tell her was that her family was undocumented. Jessica herself is a U.S. citizen, but she couldn't travel anywhere with her parents because because of their undocumented status. And so she was trying to keep that a secret. Uh, here's another similar quote, um, Eva, uh, she's 25 years old, she has DACA status, and she says, I didn't even have a real date until I was 17 because I was ashamed that they would find out. But then I had to tell my girlfriend because my brother was about to be deported. I was afraid she would break up with me. It was hard for me. I'm undocumented, I don't have papers. But as it turns out, she had the same status. And the girlfriend said, "I don't worry about it, I'm the same. At first I didn't believe her, I thought she was just trying to be nice. Now, remember, this is a region where one in 10 people are undocumented. So it's not uncommon that people find out um, that all their lives, somebody next door had the same had the same status. So this is a good example of that. All right. Next.
next implication is uh, about medical care. Um, uh, so mixed status families, uh, you know, there's there's lots of variation depending on your legal status on your ability to access medical care. It's, it's that simple. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why this is really important from a policy perspective. First of all, um, you know, people who are undocumented are often very hesitant to enroll their citizen children in programs like WIC, Medicaid, and uh, Children's Health Insurance Program run by the state because they are afraid that they're going to be on some sort of list. Um, and I can talk about that. It's, it's actually, depending on the program, not the case that it's going to affect them later. But under the Trump administration, some changes were made that made these rumors actually become a reality. And so there is a, a rightful fear that people don't want to uh, be on the radar or use resources in the United States uh, for fear of jeopardizing their futures. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, we're finding out more and more, and, and public health is doing a wonderful job at sort of giving us some hard data on this, that people's fear of deportation, not only of their own deportation, but of people in their community, has significant implications for health and well-being. And, and that can be uh, measured on the body. You can actually find some really great examples of this now where you see this stress being reflected um, in, in the body. So um, here's Lewis 38. Uh, she says, I didn't want to ask for WIC or anything because they say this could affect you if you want to fix your status later. The social worker told me it's not for you, it's for your son, who's a US citizen. But she says, I'm afraid and I don't want to have it. I'll pass on that. So the sixth implication is that, as you might imagine, there's an ever-present threat of a family separation, right? There's a really, a very real threat that when people leave their house in the morning, that they might be picked up and uh, detained or deported. And so what I found is that many mixed-status families um, had elaborate sort of uh, emergency planning measures that they put into place. Um, kind of like what we would do in the case of a hurricane or a fire or an earthquake, right? They had these plans that they discussed with their children, uh, and they and they set aside resources in case there was some kind of situation where they were separated. Um, and that went that did everything from uh, putting um, uh, changing. Um, uh, you know, children's status to to being able to live with their older siblings um, to putting property in the U.S. citizen children's name. So here's a good example, also from Evelyn. She says, um, "I told my husband." Let's put the house in our son's name since they're U.S. citizens. And I told my kids, here are the papers to the house and here are all the papers to the land, because you never know we might be picked up and not be able to return. Now, this is a case of them trying to protect their property, and, and many people do have home, their homeowners, even though they're undocumented or they might own a business. Um, but more often than not, this applied uh, also to child care. What would they do with their minor children if they were picked up? And they had lots of um, ways of thinking about, um, you know, who would the children stay with, for example. Uh, and then the seventh implication this is kind of um, sort of the last one I want to talk about here today is that uh, when people are able to regularize their status, when they're able to get a green card or, or find some way to no longer live it as an undocumented person, um, a lot of them talk about this as fixing their papers, which, to be honest, is a term that I really like because um, it implies that there's something broken with the system and it's something that can be fixed, right? It's not like this state of being undocumented that is stigmatized or, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting sort of linguistic term to say, I'm going to fix my papers, or in Spanish, we say arreglando los, los papeles, right? So it's a very interesting way of framing that something can be fixed. Um, and I found that even when people were able to do this, oftentimes there were other sort of social perils that kind of came up. Um, there might be jealousy, stratification um, within the family again, or survivor's guilt. So if somebody was able to get their papers to fix their status, but their parents weren't, for example, or their siblings weren't, again, you, you have some of these same emotions popping up. Um, and you can see uh, one of the terms that people used a lot in this context was ya te crees mucho, which if I had to translate it into English means something like, you think you're all that. Right. So there's a real conflation about like once you fix your papers, you've lifted yourself in, in a way uh, out to be outside of people in your community. And this was actually often very much conflated with whiteness or Americanness. Right. These were terms that were kind of used synonymously um, a lot. So let me just give you one quote about this and then uh, turn to another topic. So this quote is a, is by. Um, Evelyn, I believe, still. Uh, oops, sorry, it kind of went too far. And she says here, you can see really well how this stratification in the community turns out. She says, I have a friend, a neighbor, who just fixed her papers. 
Before that, she was a modest person, but having papers changed her. Now she calls the police on everybody for every little thing, like if your dog walks on her property. She calls when she didn't before, because now she has papers, you know what I mean? Right. So again, there's this idea that there's a bit of uh, jealousy that comes along with that and uh, really impacts the way people interact with one another. So when I did this study, I was really, you know, I just pointed out seven areas where people are sort of disadvantaged because of, of living in a mixed status family. It was really important to me, though, that if I brought the results of the study back to the people in the community there, that they didn't see themselves as victims, right? I know from, from, from my own experiences that they don't see themselves as victims. They certainly feel like they're disadvantaged in the United States. They feel that they're the victims of, of, of racist policies. Um, they definitely feel feel that, but they also have very many ways in which they contest and resist this. And so I wanted to kind of talk about those uh, really briefly. Um, so, you know, first of all, here you see some actual protest happening, and that is certainly one major uh, thing that people do in this region. The uh, organization that I worked with when I was doing data collection uh, was founded by uh, Cesar Chavez, and so there's a long history in this region of farm worker organizing, um, and that really shows because people are very active and very eager to get engaged and protest things that they feel are unjust. So, a couple of ways in which I saw this playing out, this contestation, is uh, people would intercede at school. Um, there were several times when children were called names by, by other students, right? Your mom, is, your mom is illegal or something, and much more racial slurs. Um, and parents would march down to the school and talk to the principal about it, right? So they really did not just, you know, just sort of take this um, without uh, contesting it. Uh, strategies for medical care, there's a lot of things I could talk about here. One of the things that um, happens is people share resources, they share medications, they they find ways to get alternative um, ways of, of, of getting care or informal ways of getting care. Um, we've already talked about advanced planning for separation, for family separation. Um, and I mentioned earlier that there is, a, this is a, a community with a long history of mobilizing. And so you would see people get together, even if they were undocumented, they would go to their city council and they would demand streetlights in their neighborhoods or better sanitation, right? So they, they weren't afraid to really stand up and try to improve their communities. Um, and then finally, um, the pursuit of legal remedies. Uh, this picture is part of a, there were, in 2015, there was a, a, a case filed against the state of Texas because the state of Texas was refusing to give undocumented parents the birth certificates of their citizen children, saying that they did not have the proper identification. And so uh, parents legitimately resisted this and won this lawsuit. <clears throat> And then sort of one last area that, uh, that where you see con contestation and resistance, if I can get the slide to change here, um, is through art, music, satire, and camp. So this is a region that has a long history of, of, of music and, 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 and art. Um, and you see everything here from um, traditional music like Tejano and Kohundo music, but also you see um, hip hop, punk, and a lot of uh, murals, artists, um, and even um, you can see in the, in the bottom picture there, a lot of drag activism. There's a very, a very big drag scene there. And so people are using drag as a way to talk about immigration issues through satire. So um, I want to come back to the issue of migration and borders in a post-pandemic world, whatever that means here in, in, in um, February 2021. Uh, certainly is not what I envisioned it uh, when I first was thinking about this talk. So one thing, of course, is that COVID-19 definitely is highlighting how important human mobility is and also how important disease mobility is and how these things are very much interconnected. Um, so borders remain a really prominent feature of this pandemic and really intersects with some of the issues I've talked about here today. One of the main things that it has shown is some of the cracks in our current systems, whether it be the healthcare system, um, education systems, political systems, and really highlights the persistence of unaddressed inequality around the world, not just in the United States, but in other places as well. We've seen a number of travel bans and border closures, and I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on some of these issues. One thing I will say is that looking historically, we know that these are not actually very effective ways of containing communicable disease. They are at the very outset, um, but as just as back in June of 2020, we were talking more about border closures than we are today. Um, once you've really reached the pandemic stage, you've you've progressed to a point where where containing um, borders really isn't the isn't the answer uh, to 
to the pandemic, and we're seeing that today play out. Nonetheless, because um, because of the uh, intimate relationship between human and disease mobility and borders, um, you do see technologies that emerge, ways in which state power is enacted through states of exception, um, and these are ways that are you know tend to become permanent. You know, think if you think if you've traveled any time in the last couple of months. Um, you probably have, if you've been to an airport, you know that our procedures now are quite different, right? Um, there's probably likely going to be things like um, having to show a, a passport of vaccination in certain ex instances. It does change the very nature of our institutions and the way in which we think about um, bureaucracy and travel. And certainly, tra um, migration itself is going to be changed uh, in, in much as it was in the post 9-11 world with new, um, new, new state processes around that issue. And I can talk a little bit more specifically about that, but certainly issues of, um, of, of cross-border freedoms, such as in the EU, have been questioned whether or not that kind of uh, uh, mobility is still going to be possible. And then one of the things that's really currently under threat is the right of territorial asylum. So the ability for people to move from one country where they are feeling threatened to ask for asylum in another country. If we limit movement, we, we end that traditional uh, form of ter territorial asylum seeking. And that'll be interesting to follow in the years to come. Um, and then, as I mentioned here, uh, we do see that it, it really does oftentimes divert resources from what is needed right now, which is building up our public health infrastructure, rather than worrying about who's coming in the country. It's a little late for that. So just to kind of wrap this up, um, what about the mixed status families in the book? How are they faring in the pandemic? The people that I introduced you to through their quotes and through some of the things I talked about earlier. Uh, first of all, this is a region that is really poor. Um, they are currently right now, uh, I think in day four or day five of, um, of a, as you know, a huge snowstorm and there uh, many people are facing a lack of electricity and water. This is a really underserved region in the first place. So when the pandemic uh, came through last year, it really impacted folks for a number of reasons. There's a number, there's a lot of pre-existing health concerns in these communities, especially diabetes and hypertension are really high rates um, that have led people to having worse outcomes than they might otherwise have had under the pandemic. As you might imagine from my presentation today, a lot of people are living in multi-generational households, which means a higher risk of transmission. These are communities where people live with grandparents and with extended family. And so um, it really does increase some of the implications for transmission. Um, not surprisingly, this is an area that has very, very low um, uh, numbers of, uh, un of, un of insured folks. And uh, subsequently, there's also a lot of barriers to testing and treatment when people do become ill with, uh, with the virus. Uh, you're probably not surprised to learn that in addition to farm work in this region, a lot of people are, are working in frontline occupations um, in the hotel, restaurant industries, and again, food service, um, agriculture. They don't get sick leave, they don't have days off, and they most certainly don't have a home office that they, have, they can be working from. And so they're definitely at much more uh, ex exposure than many other folks in the country. And then finally, mixed status families, if you know it or not, have been excluded from relief packages. Um, families that have undocumented members in them, there's a formula that actually decreases the amount of uh, aid that is available to them. Um, this uh, happened with the CARES Act uh, last year, and we're now worried that this might be happening with some new initiatives coming out of the Biden administration. So we're really pushing to emphasize that U.S. citizen children living in mixed status families deserve to have the same resources as, as every other uh, citizen. And this is, of course, despite the fact that uh, undocumented folks pay taxes often for many years. And uh, so they pay into the system. So just sort of in the interest of sort of wrapping up, I wanted to, uh, a couple points for just wrapping up th that I want to reiterate. First of all, I've talked here today about the fact that illegality, quote unquote, influences um, opportunity and resources for all. Everybody in the family, everybody in the community is impacted by this construction of legal status and uh, subsequent sort of stratification of resources. Um, I've emphasized here that borders are spaces of residence, right? They're not just lines in the sand that separate one nation state from another. Um, there, people live there, right, in the borderlands. Um, but they are highly racialized spaces, but they also are spaces of resistance, right? So I want you to take that away from this talk today as well. I mentioned earlier that immobility uh, now today is as much a feature of migration as is mobility. I think that's an important thing to consider in scholarship in the future, as well as in sort of policy measures about when we talk about migration, what does it mean to be mobile or immobile? 
And then finally, um, I'd love to have a bit of a discussion with you about to whom will borders be open in this post-pandemic world. Um, we know that the closure of borders over the last year has been selective, right? Some people are vacationing in Cancun and some people are trapped, right? So I think there uh, there is a range of mobility that is allowed and permitted, and it will be interesting to watch how this unfolds. So with that, I just want to say thank you for joining me tonight, and uh, we'll turn it over for some questions. I want to uh, thank the uh, grant funders, National Science Foundation, Winter Grant Foundation, and of course, the USF College of Arts and Sciences for hosting this event tonight um, through the Trailblazer series. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Castaneda. That was a fantastic talk, and I just I have a thousand things I'd love to talk about, and we're beginning to get questions from the audience as well. So let's just dive in, if you don't mind. Um, so in your study, you talked to many college students living in mixed-status families. Uh, are, 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 are our students here at USF having similar experiences? Can you compare for us what's happening on the South Texas border with what's happening in Florida? Is in a completely different situation because of that 100-mile uh, thing that you described, or or are there similarities? That's a great question. So, I mean, I do think that there are differences. Obviously, the the immigration enforcement, border enforcement piece is less visible here in the state of Florida, even though it is still here. It does still happen. Um, but I do think as far as the experiences of mixed status families, and especially the experiences of, uh, of young adults that I've met here at USF, they're very similar. They're very similar. So oftentimes, um, you know, they, whether they're US citizens or DACA recipients, they are often the people who are representing their family in a number of ways, mm -hmm. they translating for the for the family. They may be. Um you know, interfacing with doctors and teachers and, and government offices for their families. And they most certainly are living under a really heightened state of sort of anxiety when it comes to things like political shifts and wondering what's going to happen with the next administration. They're very curious to learn how, you know, how their family is going to be faring. Um, so I do think the, the general experience of living in a mixed status family is quite similar here in, 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 the, in Florida. And certainly the students I've talked to at USF that are uh, documented or who are U.S. citizens and mixed status families, is, it's quite similar, with, with the exception of the border region having some unique geographic characteristics. Okay. Well, here's another interesting question to build on that. So speaking of geography, uh, one, one of our guests asks, are there mixed status families in other countries besides the United States, or is this phenomenon unique to the way that we've structured citizenship and, and migration? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, it is fairly unique to the United States for a number of reasons. One is because in the United States, citizenship um, follows a territorial principle. That means if you're born uh, in the actual borders of the United States, you, you're automatically a citizen. Mm -hmm. that practice is not the same in all countries. And so for that reason, that's why we see these younger siblings who are U.S. citizens, because uh, because of the way we factor citizenship in this country. Um, and uh, so you don't see it in other places. When I think about Europe, it's, it's very uncommon to talk about a mixed status family in the same way that we do here in the United States. It's a very much a U.S. phenomenon, uh, frankly. Uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible in other places, but it really is a really prominent characteristic here in the United States. Yeah, and your analysis of the sort of dilemma of being mixed status and the sort of what I was seeing as a dialectic or a tension between sort of stigma and solidarity is really, really interesting. That whole idea that that if you somehow were to get your papers fixed, oh, you know, you're all that. That's I mean, that's that's just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So so uh, one person is asking, how might the COVID vaccine be delivered and received to undocumented communities who may be wary of government officials? Have you looked at that at all? Yeah, I mean, that's this is a really important and interesting question because uh, th that's absolutely right. They're already very hesitant to interface with um, mm -hmm. public health offices, with, with, with hospitals. Um, and so uh, the idea of distributing a vaccine also brings them in contact with state entities that they may be avoiding. Um, and I, I, I mentioned earlier the example of, of people um, not wanting to engage with with uh, public benefits like WIC or Medicaid for that right. same reason. Um, I've actually met folks who have given birth at hospitals here in the United States um, and gone back 
to repay the emergency Medicaid that covered the cost of their birth. So they'll show up at a hospital with like a wad of cash trying to repay those services because they desperately don't want to be seen as uh, using the system or using resources here in the United States. And so there's a, there's an avoidance, uh, not just for that reason, but also because people are, are hesitant of law enforcement, right? They've heard rumors right. that law enforcement might lurk outside of uh, health facilities. And, and quite frankly, that's not unfounded. There are cases where that has happened. Um, as for the vaccine distribution, Specifically, I will say that the, the the current move to distribute through pharmacies and through grocery chains actually is is brilliant. Um, um, that reaches a much larger segment of the population, and it reduces this issue of having to interface directly with um, with county hospitals or with um, other offices that they, that they might see as representatives of, of the government. Well, so, fascinating. Um, Can you? Uh, one of the things that obviously. Um, has occupied the news media over the last couple of years, uh, given the Trump administration's policies, is the whole family separation question. And I think most Americans are confused at this point about what the actual status on the ground is. And I'm imagining a lot of this is in South Texas or along that southern border. Um, can you just help us, <laughs> help the audience understand, as best as you understand it, uh, are, are children still separated from their families? What's happening in that regard? Um, is there anything you can tell us about that? And how does it connect to the kinds of things you've been talking about? Sure, sure, absolutely. So the family separation I talked about today was a little bit different. It's talking about families that are living here already who are being separated through deportation or detention practices. Right. Um, you know, getting picked up on the way to work, that sort of thing. Uh, but certainly this is exactly the same region where you saw children being put in cages uh, several years ago. This is the exact same region. Um, they, these are they're different populations because those were primarily Central American families that were coming north. Uh, the wow. families I talked to are primarily Mexican origin. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not a connection here, right? And I think to, to get to the, the point of um, where are we at today with that, there are still several hundred children who are displaced from their families. So that was a, a, an incredibly brutal practice that I think shook not only um, everyday Americans, but also uh, immigration scholars to see the extent to which that enforcement was happening at our uh, southern border. Um, and the implications are huge. To this day, there are people that are still not reunited with their families. Um, and it's really going to take a rethinking of um, our practices, practices and policies at the southern border at this point to make it much more humane and um, within within you know the rights of people who are seeking, for example, asylum, which was the case uh, for many of those families that were separated. Great, thank you. Well, let me uh, continue with a completely unfair question. Uh, as you know, uh, elements of President Biden's immigration plans came out today. <laughs> Uh, have you had the opportunity at all or to, to, to pay attention to any of that? And do you have any predictions about how the next six months to a year might go as they try to build a, a new sort of policy direction around immigration? Is there any light that you can shed on that for us? Yeah, sure. So, I, I mean, uh, the, the part I didn't wasn't able to delve into it in too much depth in the last uh, eight hours or so. But um, I will say that there are some very positive um promising areas of this policy. Specifically, uh, there's a plan for a path to citizenship that should take uh, about eight years for uh, many of the 11 million people in this country who are undocumented, who have lived here for a very long time. Um, I should mention at this point, not only do people who are undocumented pay taxes, uh, but they've often been here a very long time. The families that I talked to, the average time that they've been in the United States um, was 19 years. Right. Wow. So I've already mentioned that they were homeowners, right? They're very, very much embedded in their local communities. These are not new arrivals. And these are part of the 11 million folks that the Biden plan is trying to help out by giving them a pathway um, out of, quote unquote, illegality, undocumentedness and into um, proper, you know, sort of enmeshment with the rest of U.S. society where they already are, are located. Um, one thing that I would caution about when you hear the term comprehensive immigration reform, mm -hmm. that's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, a 
double-edged sword because what that means is that, yes, there's going to be opportunities to legalize for some folks, but part of the exchange here is greater militarization of the southern border, right? And that is part of the Biden plan right now, too, is that you'll see an increase in surveillance technologies on the, on the southern border, mm -hmm. which, depending on how you feel about these issues, you know, that's one thing. But I can say from the perspective of border communities, the people that I work with, the people that I talk to, um, they're, they're sick of their spaces of residence becoming sort of ground zero for a war on immigration. Right, a lot of them um, don't. Uh, you know, for example, the the, the Rio Grande River um, is no longer a space of recreation, um, of of enjoyment. Right, it's a militarized zone, and for people that live there, that live two blocks from the river, um, when you say comprehensive immigration reform, what they're expecting now is there's going to be a lot more, maybe not boots on the ground, not, not necessarily more border patrol, but there is going to be a lot more surveillance technologies um, under this plan that's being proposed. Um, and again, in general, I don't, you know, I, I'm just saying from, from their perspective, um, their, their backyards are being used in this way, and, and that's something to consider as well, that we're using these border communities as a way of um, setting up a no man's land and that and it's really unfortunate for people that live there. Excellent. Thank you. Um, two questions that are related to each other. One person asks, how can universities support students and families with mixed status? And another person says, does USF or other schools have a place, a club, an organization, a space to support such students? Yeah, so um, I'll just talk a little bit about my experiences here at USF. I'm um, I'm one of the facilitators of the Undocu Ally program, which we actually just had a training yesterday with about 30 folks. Um, we've been doing trainings um, every a couple times a semester through the Office of Multicultural Affairs. Uh, they have a great team over there facilitating these trainings, and we're trying to sort of educate the USF community about the circumstances of undocumented students and, and offer them support and resources um, at, at various levels. Um, so here at USF, we We've, we, we do have not only that Undocu Ally program through the Office of Multicultural Affairs, which also sets up other types of resources. They actually have a fantastic website with resources for undocumented students. But there is also a student club called Undoc United, uh, which has formed uh, by allies and, um, and undocumented students on campus. Uh, many universities are doing very similar things. I think this is part of a larger trend of finding ways to support undocumented students, especially, you know, those who have um, have lived their entire lives here in the state of Florida and consider Tampa, for example, to be their home. One thing that's uh, quite unique to Florida is that we do have a tuition equity law um, that allows undocumented students to pay in-state rates if they went to a Florida high school um, for a certain length of time and if they, you know, apply to a Florida university. So we do have some opportunities opportunities here that really can help um, them get a higher education. Um, and this was, you know, that that particular um, aspect was a bipartisan effort back in 2014. Wow. Uh, it was not particularly controversial. It was signed into law by a Republican governor and, um, you know, really uh, was not very controversial. I will say that it is currently under threat. The current legislature, there's a bill introduced to remove that opportunity. Um, but, um, you know, I think what we've seen over the past couple of years is an increase in students across Florida universities that have had the opportunity to get an education and get a college degree. Oh, fascinating. Thank you for that. Well, yeah, what's clear to me from the questions coming on the chat roll is that we need to have uh, Dr. Castaneda part two, <laughs> because we have lots and lots and lots of other questions. This is very much on people's minds. I just want to ask you one last thing, and then, and then we'll have to close. And that is, I was so touched by the photograph on one of your early slides of the butterfly, where it said, I think migration is beautiful, something like that. And you went through this very quickly at the beginning of your talk when you talked about how mobility is kind of, you know, a part of life. Um, but, you know, I have to say, migration does not have that connotation uh, most of the time that we talk about it. So just say a couple more words about trying to reframe migration as being th what birds and butterflies do and people do it too. I mean, a more positive framing of it. Sure, absolutely. So the, the monarch butterfly has actually become the symbol of the immigrant rights movement because the monarch butterfly uh, crosses borders from Canada through the United States and down to Mexico and then back from Mexico through the United States up to Canada. And so the monarch butterfly has become that ultimate symbol of what it means to be to have beautiful migration that is life affirming um, and that, you know, is really a positive thing. And so I think it's really important to understand that people have reframed it for themselves um, as, as a way of, um, you know, 
you know, holding up that migration is part of the human experience and that it's 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 um, something that they can be proud of, actually, and, and is, like I said, a, a positive thing. So. Well, Dr. Castaneda, this has been fantastic. Thank you, and thank you, William, for, for being with us tonight. Uh, I want to thank everybody for spending this evening with us. Uh, I hope you enjoyed tonight's talk. Uh, before we leave, I just want to make a couple of quick announcements. The first is that we're going to be hosting pediatrician, professor, and public health advocate Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha on Wednesday, March 24th at 7 o'clock in a virtual setting for as part of Frontier Forum. Dr. Hanna Atisha will deliver a personal account of her research and activism to expose and mitigate the effects of the Flint water crisis. And then second, we'll be hosting our final Trailblazers event of the semester on Wednesday, April 21st at 7 o'clock, where Professor of History Dr. Davide Tanasi will speak about We Are What We Eat, Diet, Cuisine, Materiality, and an Archaeology of Food and Drink in Sicily. I know it'll be a fascinating discussion, and we look forward to you joining us for it. I also want to note that as we continue to put these events together and look forward to the upcoming lectures, we hope we can count on you for your support for these programs. Thank you so much. We know it's hard to interact uh, at this uh, difficult time in the pandemic, but we're committed to continuing to bring our faculty to you and thought leaders to you virtually until we're able to gather in person again. If you would like to learn more about our lecture series or Dr. Castaneda's work and ways to support them, please leave a comment in the chat box and a member of our team will be in touch with you. Or you can contact Kelly Addington, whose contact information is also available in the chat box. I know one person asked a question about studying for a PhD in migration studies. Uh, please put your information in the chat box, and um, Dr. Castaneda will get back with you about that. I think we have some ideas about how you could do that. Uh, thank you all so much for attending tonight. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. And we hope you can all join us for both of our upcoming events. Thank you again, Heidi. Thank you, William. And thank you, everybody, for spending this time with us. Stay safe. Go Bulls.